Well, hello, listeners, and welcome back to our Experts Podcast. I'm Carol Matichka, your host, bringing you interesting guests who will share their perspectives and expertise regarding topics surrounding the profession of pharmacy. So today we have with us two very special guests, Dr. Eric Egland, as well as Dr. Anthony Kasapow. Uh, They are both associate professors with the University of Florida College of Pharmacy, and both of them are specialists in infectious disease. So they recently published an article in Clinical Infectious Diseases, which was titled Pet Nemo's Pills, The Last Loophole in in Antimicrobial Stewardship. I'll get that right. And um, they're here today to really discuss the growing, really disturbing trend in regards to pet medication usage among humans and some of those issues that surround it as well. So I'm really eager to get to this topic. So welcome, Dr. Egland and Dr. Kasapow. Thank you for coming. So let's start with a little bit of background about both of you. Tell us where you studied and where you became interested in the profession of pharmacy. And we'll start with you, Dr. Egland. Uh, sure. I attended College of Pharmacy here in Jacksonville campus. You were actually my dean. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, and then after that, I went to Gainesville campus and worked on a PhD in infectious diseases, specifically the pharmacokinetics of tuberculosis drugs, HIV drugs, and uh, antifungals. Well, what got you interested in pharmacy in the first place? Uh, in Right. To answer the first part of the question, I became interested when I was helping my grandfather who had Alzheimer's and he began taking Aricept and it helped for a little bit. And then it, he just went back to the way he was a few months before. So it didn't help in the long run. And I thought I would like to do research and medications to, to see what I could do. But I was really more interested in microbiology. That was my undergrad degree. And at first I thought I'd work in Alzheimer's and that really didn't appeal to me. Mostly it was infections and microbes and viruses. So that's how I kind of ended up going that route. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you. And Dr. Kasapo? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm originally from Illinois, so uh, northern part of Chicago, Illinois. And so, um, you know, what got me into pharmacy first was actually my uh, grandmother suffered from uh, high blood pressure or hypertension and i noticed that she had like multiple medications that she was taking you know three to four medications and she always suffered from electrolyte disturbances as well and so i didn't know and I, but i wanted to understand that more and so the beautiful part you know um, my friends and family were really close connected and i had a friend of the family who you know works for Walgreens, and so I that was my first introduction to pharmacy was to learn about the pharmacy profession was Walgreens, and and I became a tech for a few years, and after a few years, I definitely loved uh, how it worked, and uh, then I kind of understood there was a lot more medication than just high blood pressure, of course, and so I really um, wanted to go deeper into pharmacy, and so I went ahead and relocated to North Carolina, went to Wingate University, east of Charlotte, and got my PharmD degree over there. And, you know, infectious diseases during the time of pharmacy school wasn't my biggest interest. It was actually still cardio cardiovascular um, background. So I saw myself working at a clinic or working somewhere to where I could help manage diabetes, and um, any cardiovascular diseases because for me at that time pharmacy school really got me into um, you know got me into how the drugs work pharmacology standpoint understood that it can work but actually infectious diseases was actually one of those courses that was very difficult for me a lot of students can attest to that now um, here at the college of pharmacy at uf but we can for me I noticed that um, there was a lot more of, of interesting topics in infectious diseases. Maybe not as easy as a yes or no world like cardiovascular to some extent, because the, there's a lot of guidelines. There's a you know studying on thousands of patients, whereas infectious diseases, it's not as um, large sample size as we've seen. So. I was able to go deeper into actually do a PGY-1 residency at uh, here at St. Vincent's Medical Center at Riverside at Jacksonville. Um, and then I did a PGY-2 infectious disease uh, residency at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center at UPMC. So I did that and 
Um, I loved uh, infectious disease so much. I actually did a fellowship, uh, so I did you know two more years or a little bit more than two more years into uh, a fellowship uh, of research outcomes of inf- that focuses on infectious diseases at Wayne State University at Detroit, Michigan. Right. But you didn't stop there. You also no, have a master's didn't. No, degree. yeah. So, yeah, I did go to uh, Boston and uh, did obtain a master's. He's very humble about where he obtained the master's. <laughs> yeah, so I did go to Harvard University to obtain my master's. And that was really because my love of research really grew to I wanted to focus on epidemiology. So I did get a master's in public health, focuses on epidemiology with an emphasis of research and design. So I really focus on a lot of my uh, technical skills on that. Well, thank you both. You're both very um, well equipped to be discussing this today. So we really appreciate you being here. So we are talking about pet medications. Can you tell the audience what all this really encompasses and which pet medications are most commonly used by humans? So, well, to start out, how we became interested in it was a family member of mine asked me how he should store his antibiotics. And I was wondering why he needed to store his antibiotics. I thought maybe it was just for a a local infection, something, uh, you know, common, uh, you know, skin infection or something. But no, he handed me a bottle of uh, amoxicillin for fish. So I had no idea what, why he wanted fish antibiotics, and he had more than one bottle. It was over, I think it was 100 capsules or 50 capsules in the bottle, and he had more than one bottle. He had several, and it was just in case something happened. So mm. he's a bit of a prepper, and he wanted to have them on hand in case he needed antibiotics in case something went down. So that's how we first were introduced to pet antibiotics being used in humans. We went down a rabbit hole. Uh, Anthony had seen some papers actually recently discussing fish antibiotics. So that's kind of how we got started. So I would say... And how long ago was that? uh, Three years ago now. Three years, yeah, or even further. I think maybe even four or five. Yeah, it could be. And we're continuing to see this grow, it appears? Yes, now, I think with... um, Post-pandemic, I think we've been giving, right, we really want to give access to patients, uh, to healthcare, and so telehealth has been the biggest thing that we've seen, which is great for giving access to, to patients who need help. Um, but there's been some things that we've noticed that's different, I would say, as in um, with telehealth that we wouldn't expect it to be done. So We've seen advertising of medications that, right, or people feel like they may have a certain condition or maybe a disease, whether uh, most likely if it's more of a chronic disease that they should probably get access to a healthcare provider and then, you know, have further discussion and potentially diagnose that person Mm -hmm. and then give medications if necessary. So we've seen that from from a lot of advertising and social media. Um, and if you're still watching TV and TV, but of course on social media, we've seen a lot. So I, I just saw that this might be the new wave of how it's going to potentially be giving. And so when we talk about pet medications, you all are talking about, these are medications that you can order on the internet essentially, right? Not Correct. through a veterinarian. Right. You can order them from various, There, uh, Brandon Brookstaver, and his group had a article out, and I think he identified 24 um, places you could purchase it from on the internet. And it's primarily just different entities getting these pet antibiotics, which are repackaged from human antibiotics and sold as as fish antibiotics. And fish antibiotics is probably the most likely, since it's not requiring a veterinary prescription to purchase these, whereas some things like um, antibiotics for dogs or cats, you do need to have a uh, prescription, at least here in the U.S. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, we knew it was actually rebranded because we actually just looked at the capsule itself. Um, so we saw this pill and we saw the ID on it and it's exactly the same identification. Uh, these are the pills we count in the wow. pharmacy. Yeah, right, so. and like they look exactly like those. You look at the identifications, like same color, same identification that you would see for humans that's the same for that's being used for pet, pets. So do you know the history behind all of this? 
where did this begin? It sounds like you really stumbled upon it a few years ago, but um, is this more of a recent issue? I would say no. No. I There's, think it's just yeah. tip of an iceberg, I would say. Yeah, and it's kind of a um, an open secret among the military. Um, special forces, they... A lot of times, once they're in civilian life, they would go. You can purchase, or my family member who purchased it is ex-military, and he knew you could go to a pet store and get these antibiotics. That are just, mm -hmm. yeah. interesting. So. Okay. Um, and so, is it mostly antibiotics that you see then, or are there other types of medications that are branded as pet medications that people are are getting a hold of? Primarily, I would say fish antibiotics. There are a couple others. I think I saw one for birds that was available, parakeets or parrots or something, but primarily I would say fish antibiotics. Yeah, I think for the other medications, they're already available as over-the-counter, right? right? So for human consumption, for home, human use. So I would say those indications are not, that's not the loophole, I would say. It's, it's those yeah. antibiotics. And then you kind of have to separate the pet, pet antibiotics from actual human antibiotics that are being sold from other countries that are res, less regulated than the United States. Gotcha. So um, we did talk about amoxicillin. I'm assuming penicillin perhaps is available yeah. as well. Um, fluoroquinolones, have you yeah. seen those? Superfloxacin. Wow. wow. Yeah, Doxycycline. And then tetracyclines. Bactrim. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so tetracyclines has been a big one that we've seen. And do they provide any information with them, any guidance? I'm assuming no, because they're made well, for pets. They, they provide a, a little bit of guidance in how to use it in an aquarium, dumping one or two capsules mm -hmm. into a 10-gallon aquarium. That's right. the only guidance that How would you really provided. know that's how many parts per million? And right. I just yeah, there's was... not too much data indicating that would be accurate even for, for fish. So. And do they have the milligrams on there at least the dosage they do have the okay. milligrams on there interesting yep. all right well and thank you and, and we've got some dosage, pictures so, that yeah. we can yeah, show the audience we'll as here. well yeah sure and then um so why are people doing this why are people seeking these pet medications uh price avoiding uh g going to their primary care physician or primary care provider that saves a lot of money yeah, I think it, well, you have to think about it is, is it's the access and, you know, we know it's already difficult to go to an urgent care or the long lines of urgent care. And there's some places where if, even if it's more rural, that the urgent cares may not be even available um, or those critical access hospitals are still too far. Mm -hmm. So um, I could see it where, I mean, if you don't even have, a, you know, service for like dentists, in your area, like you're not even having very much access to any health care. So for for some people, when we hear the word prepper, then they're preparing for things. I'm not saying it's a preparing for like the end of the right. world apocalyptic, right, or a zombie apocalypse. It's right. more like if something did happen to my arm or I get cut and it looks very infected, mm -hmm. you know, from a local standpoint, from a yeah. you know, skin infection, should I be treating it with? I'm like, I hope they know that, you know, antibiotics, not all antibiotics are exactly the same. So right. that's that's a concern from, you know, from an infectious disease. If we want to make sure, or we tell our students at the College of Pharmacy, as well as any healthcare provider, you know, make sure that we give the right drug for the right bug. But we have to know what infection it looks like. It's not for the same. Like if I have a respiratory infection, right? We've noticed from from an antimicrobial stewardship standpoint that the prescriptions that people are asking and they are getting access that about 30% of those respiratory um, diagnoses shouldn't have been given with an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Because we know that the number one uh, pathogen is gonna be a virus that causes that, those upper respiratory symptoms. So th those are some concerns where, you know. And why getting, is that concerning if, if somebody gets a, and, and for those who might be listening, why is it concerning to take an antibiotic when it's a virus? Go ahead, Dr. Kasafel. So, well, so most of these pen antibiotics that we hear and we're, talk, uh, and we're talking about, it's, it's most of those are going to be for treating bacterial uh, pathogens or to eradicate or to, re to, to kill them. So 
we really want to be aware that these antibiotics are focusing more on uh, bacterial pathogens. And so when we hear some infections, if it's a, like a respiratory infection, a good portion of those, a majority of them are going to be viruses, which is a different type of uh, pathogen, in which, can, in which the antibiotics will not even have any effect against. So basically, you're just adding side effects. You're getting all the side effects with none of the benefit. Right. And aside from side effects, what else could be a potential issue with the antibiotic usage? Sure. Drug interactions okay. um, and antimicrobial stewardship, drug resistance. That's a huge concern. Right. Absolutely. So um, how bad is drug resistance right now? I've been asked that question it's quite a, a bit. It's a bit of a loaded question. It is a loaded um, question, isn't it? For another session. <laughs> yeah. <that's, laughs> that might be too much to talk about here. Well, well, I think it's, a, it's some things when we hear in the media and the news, right, the most common one or, or, or what journalists have used is superbugs. We don't use that term, but it's, it's because some of these pathogens, like a, a common one we hear is like MRSA or some people may call it MRSA or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And so this pathogen can be found on our skin on some pe on some people normally. It may not be f resistant like this superbug concept because we hear that word super because it may be resistant to other uh, common drugs that we've seen, right? So there's some that can be resistant to um, to Bactrim, which is another drug that we hear, or your or uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Um, it's another oral medication that can be seen that we found also um, as a pet antibiotic that could be resistant. But usually in the community, that could be used. Um, but sometimes these bugs that we hear, they can be resistant to like fluoroquinolones. Like fluoroquinolones would not be preferred to use against like this. But that's a common uh, other drug that we've seen prescribed in general. Um, and so we want to be cautious of when we see see pen antibiotics that, you know, what other, <clears throat> you know, what other, what infection do you have? It, I think to have that discussion needs to be with a healthcare mm -hmm. provider. Right. True. And from all of this excess use, um, pet medications adding to that excess use for these bacteria, then becoming yeah. resistant to all of our antibiotics, certainly concerning. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And it, it may not be as much as other antibiotic uses in farm animals or um, oxytetracycline in fruit trees or something that's getting into the environment. It may just be a small drop in the bucket, but it is concerning, especially for patients, if they're not getting the right drug for the right bug, that's a problem. And we had a hurricane in the Panhandle not too long ago where a lot of people couldn't get out of their houses and some of them had injuries. So that would be a case where you might want to use those antibiotics, but again, you might just be making the situation worse if you have a cut or something, and then you take ciprofloxacin, you have diarrhea, you're just getting more and more worn down, and it's not taking care of the infection. So it could be making the situation worse than, instead of actually helping. Yeah. And also part of what, when we think about managing an infection, right, is also the duration and the dose. So how do we know if the person who's using these medications for, you know, off-label use, right? They're using, um, what if, let's say it's not covered, we have one, but let's say if it does cover, but you're giving the wrong duration. Yeah. So meaning like if it's supposed to be for 10 days or seven days, but you only give it for two or three days, is that okay? And the answer is potentially no, because you may have diminished some of those bacteria that's there let's say that drug was active against that bacteria, but you didn't fully eradicate it. And so what will happen is the ones who are lingering there may now become resistant to the drug that you ha have been using for only those few days. Um, and so that's an important factor. Now, the other side of that spectrum is what if you treat for a longer, too long? Well, we talked about side effects, but I think the other thing too is also these antibiotics are going to not only eradicate that pathogen that's causing the infection, but also the bacteria that's found within your body. Your microbiome is, is another term that we've heard. So you're eradicating that or disrupting it. 
So you're causing, you may cause some disrupting in your gut. That's why we hear diarrhea may be a cause or uh, Clostridium difficile infection or C. diff. And certainly in our elderly, especially. Yes. Mm -hmm. So those are some things that we want to be cautious when we're, you, you get a medication. We don't give the whole bottle to patients, right. right? We make sure that the duration is appropriate, the dose is appropriate. That's why we give those certain um, set number of pills or tablets. Whereas in this case, they're having a whole bottle of 50 capsules or maybe or 100 capsules. And uh, again, as Dr. Kasapa alluded to, if you, cephalexin, if you need to take it two or three times a day, four times a day, and you're only taking it once a day, that's not going to work. Sure. Yeah. Um, lots of potential issues, obviously, there. So do you have any, I know you shared a specific example. Do you know of any other specific examples you can share with the audience? Uh, well, this is a little, not quite pet antibiotics, but we have noticed on social media advertisement, at least uh, my feed and Facebook, regarding uh, a five-pack of antibiotics plus add-ons that you can get. For oh, instance, wow. ivermectin, uh, you just contact the website and they'll put you in touch with the clinician at least this at this point at least you're being in contact with a, a clinician the problem is if you get a five pack of antibiotics for they're doing a lot of different an, uh, advertisement there are no pharmacies in the um, forest mm -hmm. um, you know get ready for the uh, zombie apocalypse basically so the advertising is kind of two preppers and there's different targeted areas based on the different advertisements so and if you're in a situation, again, with the hurricanes wiped out, you're not going to have access to the clinician. So it's going to lead kind of to the to the same outcomes um, because it looked like from the advertisement, advertisement, I saw that they would be sending more than what you would need. So, yeah, like uh, it was almost a 28-day supply. Right, instead which, of a... Or, which is kind of interesting. Or if it right. was... Uh, it was a little bit longer than your normal, like five or seven days. Exactly. It was a good month almost. And they're not saving much on cost. I think it was a few hundred dollars, 200 some odd dollars anyway. Wow. And you mentioned the microbiome. Um, so one of my areas of interest is in obesity. And we're doing a lot of studies in regards to the microbiome and how um, that may affect uh, some individuals in regards to obesity. So um, lots of potential side effects and issues associated with the overuse of antibiotics. Um, so those are some of the dangers. We talked about that. We talked about safer methods um, that patients could go about. You know, when we, we were talking about all of this, and you mentioned rural areas, and there may not be a, a clinic where somebody can go to, this really makes me think immediately of, of pharmacists. I mean, pharmacies are in, everywhere rural areas everywhere. Um, and as we begin to get, uh, you know, more of the ability to do test and treat and other options to help care for patients, I think this, this is somewhere that, again, we can really talk about how something like this could, could move the profession forward and really helping in regards to patients and especially those who don't get access. So um, thank you for sharing all of this. So this could be a tough question to ask a patient and not something we would normally consider as pharmacists, but um, how would you recommend bringing this up if maybe you suspect that a patient is, is using pet antibiotics or maybe they come to you and they show you, hey, I got this bottle. Uh, can you help me out and, and asking for advice, dosage, et cetera? How should pharmacists respond? Well, uh, definitely. That's part of you know, when you're doing your interviewing for any patient, right, we want to make sure we get a thorough history. And so get as much history as you can, like how recent, right, how long of a duration. And, you know, as uh, hopefully if the patient can, can give you a little bit more detail of those, then you can get a little bit more insight. Because if that drug that they've used was a pen antibiotic, there's two things that we have to assume, right? One, it probably, look at the expiration date if that's available, because it probably, uh, if it has been held for a long time, you can also assume that it may not be stored in an appropriate, so the dose may not be as strong or potent as it was. Um, those are one things that I would be cautious, but that still, there's still some active ingredient in there. So you have to also potentially assume that whatever bug that it, probably could have eradicated may not because 
under dosage or right it's not potent anymore and i would i would think as for me when thoroughly thinking like okay they took enough duration and it should have done well if it didn't then think now just like what we always hear is like this infection may be resistant or this pathogen may be resistant to this common drug and which we didn't want to see and now it's Mm -hmm. now it in this scenario has happened and so now we're going to have to think about like is there any other scenarios that we can talk about but most likely if it's coming to our you know rural or community pharmacy this is something where you have to start thinking about they need to go to your emergency room but this the story still needs to be sent out so as a pharmacist make sure that the story is sent or this whole history is given to the next provider because they, if they don't we don't want this patient if it's if it gets worse to get systemic issues right they may get shortness of breath uh, hypotensive may lead to sepsis right we don't want that to happen and and if it does then they're going to still give the you know first line therapy and if it and this first line therapy was that pet antibiotic that they were taking mm-hmm. then we've already behind the behind taking care of this patient for a few days mm-hmm. but yes hopefully convincing them to go to a primary care physician get checked get properly diagnosed and then again as anthony was saying to um, share the history that they were actually on this sure and i work in community pharmacy so we do have a lot of difficult conversations all the time so good so there are certainly other ways people can potentially um, get a hold of of pet medications outside of that patient provider relationship uh, can you talk to any of those and being working in a retail pharmacy or community pharmacy certainly you've you've seen some of that yeah so not necessarily um, pet pet antibiotics but also pet pain meds mm-hmm. we've seen that I, um, there's been issues with people abusing their animals and getting pain medications mm-hmm. through that manner so that's yeah, kind actually, of another loophole right and, and we work with the College of Veterinary Medicine. And unfortunately, they're having to train veterinarians now on how to look for injuries on animals um, that might have been inflicted by the the owner um, to make sure that 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 wasn't the case. So um, so what do you do in in that situation if you suspect maybe somebody is, is coming in with a prescription for a pet, but you're thinking it might be for them? Uh, usually we contact the veterinarian. Okay. Um, and discuss it with them and see what their considerations are. Okay. Yeah. And I, Thankfully, heard... it doesn't happen often. Most people sure. love their pets. Yeah, absolutely. But I think other situations just of, and, and maybe their pet does have a valid reason for having sure, a prescription, yes. but they're. Yeah, that, they I mean, I think all of us store whatever meds we still have left over are in our on our shelf in the bathroom. So, yeah, yeah it's not uncommon for people to keep their pet meds in case their pet needs it or if they need it. So if you had maybe a patient who came in who has prescriptions for several different pets and they could be, um, you know, some type of controlled substances and you're concerned for that patient, um, some of our pharmacists who might be listening, is that something where you can reach out to the provider? Is that yeah, you can reach out to the provider of that and, pa- of the farm, right. of the patient. Yes, as opposed to the, um, the not, veterinary. No, I don't think you can necessarily reach out to the the patient's provider in that case. Okay. You would have to reach out to the veterinary, um, the vet in charge. Which we've had people who raise a lot of a lot of dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, sure, we used to have people when greyhounds were allowed to race. They would come in with a lot of medications for their. They're greyhounds, so they had multiple animals. Right. Um, but that's just usually a quick call to the vet. Okay. Yeah. I would think unless perhaps maybe you've got a you know relationship with the um, the patient. Yeah, with the patient. With the patient maybe yes. To talk to them. Right. And, yeah. You know, really. Yeah. I mean, okay. you can have that conversation, and I would highly recommend it to at least have that conversation. Just inquire, see how they're doing. Right. There could be other things. Yeah. That you may want to know what's happening to that patient because if they're, I mean, if if they made the time to make it to the pharmacy, but they don't have the time to get to the urgent care emergency room, it is a little bit, you know, less available to have those access. Is not so have that conversation because maybe for us as pharmacists, we can try to help them be an advocate for that patient, sure, right? And so try to let them get those access or figure out how they can get to what they need. Yeah, absolutely. 
and then I always recommend having um, available resources if you suspect that somebody may be dealing with some type of substance use disorder or an yes. issue. In, in yeah. that case, um, knowing what resources to reach out to, of course. Um, and that's why if we can have conversations with our patients, that's so important. I know it's challenging think, during uh, these times. Community pharmacy it, is, it is very challenging right now. Yeah. And um, really hoping for all of our community pharmacists that a lot of this starts getting worked on and fixed because I know there's a lot of frustration out there yeah. and stress. So hopefully we're heading in the right directions. I, I hope so. Sure. Okay, well, thank you both for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be on our show today. Do you have anything you want to leave, leave the audience with today? Hmm. No. Don't, okay. Don't, don't buy no, pet antibiotics. <laughs> uh, don't buy pet antibiotics, sure. Or just well, maybe be a, more be, aware. I think for the listeners, it's just just be aware that when you're asking for history or people have are giving – you know, their chief complaint, right, or their concerns to you that they feel like they may have a cold, and you ask if they have taken any uh, medications, right? But you may want to rephrase, you know, rephrase that question um, if they've taken someone else's meds, yeah. whether mm -hmm. it's a family member or or a pet, or maybe a friend loaned them, quote unquote, loaned That's them. That's also another. Right, and so we've heard of that as well. So I, why I would always ask is if you're, Asking questions of what they've taken before is to ask those specific questions. It's like the same thing when we ask, have you taken anything over the counter? But then we also have to say the words, have you taken any herbal or supplements? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. to some eyes, they don't think that's an over the counter. But for us, we know that is an over the counter. So when we ask, have you taken any medications or prescription medications? Or have you taken anyone else's? Because when they think prescription, a lot of people really think, oh, I don't have any prescriptions. That's, I don't have anything that I go to refill right, right now. But then but it was right. someone else's prescription, whether it was taken from a pet or taken from a family member or some friend, that's something to always be aware of. Yes. Sure. And I think reaction, when if you find yes. out yeah. that they are taking something, is extremely important in regards to making sure that they feel comfortable talking yeah, to you yeah, about absolutely. it so that you can help them. Um, in the future and that they'll come to you. And I had this come up recently at the pharmacy I work at where the wife was taking the husband's Xanax. They both have the same milligram, same dosage. And she ran out early and came in and wanted to get her prescription filled. And I told her it was too early and asked her why she ran out. And she said, oh, um, I've been taking my husband's. And then the, the end date was already the the date had already passed the expiration date for refilling so uh but she did admit she had been taking her husband's less sure. yeah so and that's where you can step in and yeah. and you know help them out hopefully at that yeah, point in time yeah, it's and just right a quick call to the they understand what's clinician going on and, and why that's had to go see them so all right well thank you both for taking the time again and thank you to our audience for listening today and you'll find a link to the article written by dr eric eglin and dr anthony kasapow it's in clinical infectious diseases volume 70 issue one it was january 1st of 2020 when that came out so we'll make sure that we have a link for you as well and take care everyone thank you for listening thank you <laughs>